Amen. Amen. You may be seated in his presence. Thank you, ladies, for the wonderful uh, worship. And also thank you for the lady, young lady who prayed. I don't know where she went. Uh, thank you. That was powerful and that was amazing. Amen. Amen. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I thank God for the rain. Uh, isn't it wonderful that the Lord has given us rain in this season? Amen. We just celebrate him. I also want to thank God for those who are watching us online because I believe that there are many families that are connecting to us from their homes. Amen. I also want to thank you for braving the rain and coming. So as I share the word of God today, I'll be talking to families I'll be speaking to families, those who are home and those who are here. I also, I'll also be speaking to our ladies here, the young ladies here, who are trusting God for marriage. Let me tell you, the most wonderful thing that can happen in your life is to prepare for your marriage when there is no one in sight. That is the most beautiful thing you can do to yourself. It's the greatest favor you can do to yourself. Prepare yourself for your family. Amen? I remember when I started praying for my own family, for my own marriage. I would literally take time to go to church in the evening and pray for them. Before, I didn't even know where my husband was, Pastor Riggs. I had no idea. Actually, I was wondering why he's taking time to come, taking too long to come. I was wondering when will he come, but that did not prevent me from praying. I also prayed for my children. I called them into existence before they came. So if there is a prayer you can pray for yourself in this season, is prayer for your family and prayer for your marriage. Uh, this month, when I, when I was looking at the theme, empowered relationships enabled ministry. Myself, I was excited because this theme is a theme for family ministry. This is a theme we can run with any day in all the ministries, men's ministry, women, ARC ministry, and even the marriage enrichment ministry. I believe this, this theme, marriage enrichment ministry. In fact, because they should have been here to support their pastor. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and I want to start with a scripture that is, that is an amazing scripture. And I, I want to believe that this will be your, your song. This will be your... your uh, God is going to, to shift something in your life, shift something in your family. Amen. Because Pastor Riggs has already prayed an amazing prayer for me. I don't need to pray. I receive his prayer and blessing. Matthew 26 verse 7. Today I'll be looking at keys, keys for effective empowered relationships in your family, in your home. So I want to read a scripture in Matthew 26 verse 7. The story is the story about the, the, the woman with the alabaster jar. I had to go online and look at how that alabaster jar looks like. An alabaster jar was a box, a box containing precious oil, precious perfume. It was the best thing this woman had. It was the most precious ointment that she, she had in her own life. It was the greatest gift she had. And what was amazing me, Pastor Riggs, is that she did not choose to bring it to church. Because some of us, if we have a precious gift, that we want to give to the Lord, we bring it to church. We bring it to the altar where everyone is looking. But for this particular gift, the gift was done in the home, in the family. The Lord Jesus had been invited by a man. This was in Bethany. And Jesus had been invited into the house of a man called Simon. Can you believe Jesus is in your house taking a meal with you? I don't know how we would prepare for that meal. I don't know. We would wash the walls, wash the tables. Everything would be clean. And the best would be in the kitchen. But it's amazing that Jesus Christ, who had visited this home, who was the chief guest, 
when there was a confusion and, and a concern and a complaint about what this woman was doing. Because the Bible says that this woman, having an alabaster box of very precious oil, having an alabaster cruise of exceeding precious oil, having an alabaster vial of very expensive perfume. She came where Jesus was reclining and poured it on his head. Poured it on his head. And suddenly everybody was complaining, it's too precious, it's too expensive. But the Lord Jesus had been in this home. Actually, he told Simon, Simon, since I came, you didn't receive me properly. Since I came, no one washed my feet. No one even gave me a towel to wipe my head of the dust. And what this lady has done, actually, the Bible says that, from the words of the Lord Jesus, he said, what she has done today will be spoken everywhere the gospel is preached. What she has done today, it has made her stand out and become distinguished. When the alabaster jar was open, by the way, it was broken. It was not open. Broken. She must have, I don't know how she broke it, but she must have hit it on something or dropped it. She, must, she broke it. But when the, when the scent of the perfume came out from the alabaster jar, and as it was being applied on the Lord's head, it shifted the environment of the house shifted the smell of the house. I want to believe if what Jesus said, which I believe is the reality, if he himself, they had not wiped his feet, I believe there were other feet there that were, had not been wiped. And I believe the other feet of the other people were smelly. <laughs> I believe that they were sweaty. This is the Middle East. Sun, hot sun, a lot of sweat. I believe that there, was, there were other things, other smells, mixed with the smell of food and mixed with toxic, toxic attitudes that were in that house. Prejudice. Because the moment the lady did this, they say, ah, does she know, does he not know what woman she was? But what they don't understand is that uh, this woman who is pouring this was not the same woman they knew. She had already received an encounter with Jesus. And she had changed. So when she's offering this, she knows what they say she was. Why am I bringing this story into this theme of this month? I'm bringing it because when the alabaster jar was open, everyone in that house became a beneficiary. Suddenly they were all smelling good. Suddenly they were, there was fragrance. There was aroma. Everyone was smelling good. And this is a picture of most families today. Many homes, if you enter many homes, not every smell is good. Sometimes, some of the homes have, have had to toxicity. toxicity. Eh, that's a hard word. Let me, let me use the word negativity. It's easier. Some of the homes have had drama. Some of the homes have had challenges. And, be, and, and they have not, those things have not been handled. And they have stayed there for long. Some of the homes, they need a paint job. They need to at least see the paint here. If you've stayed in the same home for many years, hey, like some of us, the homes we grew up with, saying even we would volunteer to, to paint. Eh? Some of those things need the breaking of an alabaster jar. Some of those need, need you to come out and give your best. I'm sure this lady, when she was looking at everybody and everything they are doing, she came to a point and felt that I cannot continue any longer this way. I cannot continue ignoring Jesus' presence in this house. I cannot continue ignoring him in this house. Do you know that Jesus is a present presence in your own home? 
If you're a believer, the Lord Jesus is present in your home. I know some of us leave him in church. Some of us, we come, we meet him here, and we leave him here. Back on Sunday. I'm a Wednesday service when we come. But your own home is your family altar. The Lord Jesus, he says, where two or three are gathered in my, in, in, in my name, I am there. So Jesus Christ is there. This woman took a lot of courage. It took courage for her to stand in the middle of all these people. Because what she was going to do was to change the momentum of things. The way things were going, they would have continued going there. She interrupted them. My prayer is that today somebody will interrupt things in their home. They will interrupt how things have been being handled in that home, in that marriage. You will come to the word of God and say, Jesus, I want to interrupt my home. So how did she interrupt? She interrupted by giving her all, giving her everything. I believe that if each one of us would give our all to our families, our families would stand. If each of us gave our all to our marriages, our marriages would stand. Today I am speaking to that marriage that has been existing, that has been there for some time, and they have given up. They have said, it's too much work. In, in marriage ministry, Parklands Baptist Church Marriage Enrichment Ministry, we believe that marriage is work. We believe that you must work. It is work. Marriage is work. But we also believe that marriage works. We also believe that marriage works. We believe that if you put the time, if you put the work, if you put it, whatever you put in that relationship is what will come out. Are we saying it is easy? No. But we are saying that like the woman with the alabaster jar, we are willing to give our oil. oil, oil. We are willing to break it. We are willing to say, by the way, do you think it was easy to break that alabaster jar when Simon was watching? The moment she stood, because you see the men were reclining. You need to know that in this culture, men and women don't mix. So the men were reclining, and Jesus was reclining there. The women must have been in the kitchen, in the backyard, or somewhere else. But this lady was feeling that, Lord, I need a change. I need to see things move here. I need to see a shift. Maybe she wanted to get married. Eh? Today people are sowing seeds to be married. <laughs> Maybe she wanted to, to get married. <laughs> so she thought, what can I do? And the burden in her heart, she said, I, I can't continue this way. And she went, entered the room. I know they scrutinized her. They even asked her, what does she think she's doing? You know, when your wife begin to, begins to break her alabaster jar, Pastor Rick and others here who are married, when your wife removes the most precious thing she has, you know, women, we are funny creatures. We have precious things, which our husbands do not even know. My God, we have some plates cutlery, cups, which we have kept. We have kept somewhere. And where we have kept them, they are, they are, they are actually for important guests. It's as if those important guests, where are they? They haven't come. We put them for, I have friends who kept those, those china, precious things. They kept them so well. And one day, they were going to, to look for them, to just do a spot check, and realize they had been stolen by a house girl. Hey, you can imagine the pain. Some of, so the day, the day your wife removes her precious alabaster jar and decides that today is when I am breaking it to my king in my house, to my Lord in the house. You know, even Sarah called her husband Lord. To her Lord. <laughs> Some of the men might say, Unataka. Unataka nini. What do you want? 
They, they, are you getting? Because they weren't used to this. But today I'm trusting God that there will be a bold woman who will say, I'm going to give my best. I, I'm going to give what I had reserved. Friends, we have only one life to live. And the one life that we have to live, we are going to live it well and we are going to live it for the Lord. Today, I'm trusting God that there is a family. There is a family that will say, these things we've been hearing this week about empowered relationship. I'm going to do them. I'm going to do them. These things I've been hearing being preached here. I'm going to start. I'm going to take my alabaster jar, which I had reserved for when people here begin to like me and change, and I'm just going to break it. The Bible says that when she broke this, but they, after Jesus' word, everybody, everybody accepted the oil. So I want to talk about courage. Courage to do, courage to make a shift in your family. Courage to sh shift things in your home, in your life. Courage to abandon yourself and say that I'm going to invest in this family. I'm going to give this marriage a chance. I'm going to give this man a chance. I'm going to give love a chance. And maybe you're listening to me and you're saying, Pastor, you don't know. This is not the person I married. Pastor, you don't know. This is not the family I, I wanted. This is not the family I had expected to have. My prayer today, I want to help us understand the issue of grace, the issue of anointing, and the issue of seasons. When a word is released and declared, the month of empowered relationships, it means there is a grace for relationships. It means there is a grace for restoration. Actually, Pastor Simon said it is the week of reconciliation on Sunday. He said Monday, reconciliation Monday. Today is reconciliation Wednesday. So you can tap into this reconciliation and have reconciliation. Open an alabaster jar of reconciliation in your own home. Now, when this lady opened that jar, she didn't look at the people. When you do your part, we allow God to do his part. When you do your part, you allow God to do his part. Now, very quickly, because of time, because of time, I want to say that, what are, the, what are some of the keys? I want to put keys in your hands. Keys that work. Then when you go home, if you use these keys, they work. And these keys have been declared here. The first key which has been repeated here this month is the key of love. The key of love. The key of love. That is the first key that we have seen mentioned here every day in this month. The key of love. Many times when we hear this, this message of the key of love, sometimes we don't want to listen to that. I can tell you myself, countless times, Times when I've had summons of love, I have felt like I want to walk away. I want to leave. I want to leave. I don't want to listen to them sometimes. But I want to thank God for this book by Dr. Dom, uh, uh, Dobson. He has a book which is called uh, Tough Love. He has a book called Tough Love. It's, the book is Love is Tough. Love is Tough. Because love is tough. Love is not an emotion. Love is an action. Love is tough. I told you, the belief we have that family, marriage is work, but it is, it works. Love is tough. Love is not wishy stuff. Love is not wishy stuff. Love is not, love is not emotions. Sometimes people think that these emotions, what do I do if the emotions have ended? What do I do which is 
we, which when the emotions have ended. You know, love is giving. Love is giving. You cannot say you love somebody if you cannot give. Love is giving. Love is giving. I will read this quickly because of time. Love is giving. Love builds slowly. Love builds slowly. Love builds relationships slowly. Be very concerned about a person who tells you they love you after just attending one Wednesday service. You are having tea? Yeah, the tea is there. You are having tea? You, you, you are cups? Guzana? And he assumed that's a sign from the Lord. And he declares his love. Be very careful with that kind of love. Because that kind of love will go the same way it came. Love builds slowly. Love lasts a long time. Love lasts a long time. It has staying power. Love has a staying power. Love is commitment. Love is commitment. The other day we were having a conversation with, with, with the team that runs marriage ministry. And we were looking at, at the challenge we are having today in families. And we realized that the greatest challenge is that many of us have been influenced by other cultures, not the biblical culture. The biblical culture and some cultures in this world, they love the one they married. That is the one they, you know, why do you, what do you think happens when somebody is brought a wife to their home? They just love her. They love the one they married. But some of us have been exposed to loving, to falling, to marrying the one we love. The challenge is when that love ends, we don't know what to do. We want to come out of that relationship. So love is commitment. Commitment is not emotional. Commitment is just commitment. It's saying that I will be here for you. Come rain, come shine, I will be here, I will be constant. Love is caring, love is deep, love is secure, love is trusting. I'm just giving you definitions of love. These are definitions of love that has been tried and tested and that you can use them. So the key of love, the key of love must be used in the family to open the hearts of people. The key of love must be open to heart, open the hearts of the children, to open the heart of the spouse. I am, I like the, I like the definition of God's love, agape love. Marriage, it is agape love that can carry you through. Agape love is love that seeks the highest good of the family. That means I will pay rent, I will pay bills, I will pay school fees, I will, do, I will cook the meals, I will serve the meals. Even when I feel, I will do my part. That is agape. Agape does what is good for the other person. Agape says, this is what is good. So, so sometimes what is good, what is good could be correcting. What, be, what is good could be asking someone to sit down, we have this conversation. So it does what is good. It's amazing that if you look at the scriptures, uh, there, are, there are different instructions that have been given to the, to the believers. I want you, in your free time, you can look at the one another passages in the Bible. We have about, I think there are 59 one another passages, which instruct us on how to live with one another. I believe these passages would be useful if they are done in the home. These passages, we are to love one another. We are to be devoted to one another. Uh, protect one another in the home. But I want to move from the general commands of loving the general commands of loving to specific commands, uh, general commands and instructions for the family because the instruction to love is a general command. We are to love one another and you can read those scriptures in your own. But I want to look at specific instructions that have been given. There is specific instruction and general instruction. So the specific instruction to love is for everybody. We are to love one another. But then the Lord goes an extra mile and gives instruction to the man 
to love his family, specifically to love his wife. So I will touch that. I know we don't have a lot of time, but I believe that we have enough time to look at this, these scriptures. Allow me, I always like to speak to the women first because I'm a woman. And if I speak to the, to the women first, the men feel safe. Like Sijakuja, Kuasumbua. Sindio Pastor Rick, Suna Vile Pastor Rick, Sana Cheka. I like that. Yeah. So allow me to speak. So there are spe- the Bible has specific instruction to wives, specific instructions to husbands. So, so the first key is love. Love. Let me use, let, because that's the, the, the key I started with. Husbands are to love. Let me say love the family. Love the family. Love the wife. Love the family. What does that mean? What that means is that the husband is to set the tone of the home. Set the tone of the home. The husband is to set the tone of the home. How you enter your home, and I'm just going to give you practical things. How you enter your house can change the whole environment. If you enter your home, and I thank God for the things men do outside. I thank God for the efforts they do in, in, in looking for money, for food, for rent. I thank God for the burdens they bear, the responsibility they bear. But when you enter your home, when you enter your home, you don't have to announce it. You don't have to announce, unajua vile ni nataftega pesa. You don't have to announce it by how you look. You don't need to enter. And when you're entering, unaondoa watu kwa njia. Unawaongelesha after 30 minutes. One of my mentors told me, was telling us, before you come home, if you're a man, grab a banana on the way. Eat something. Bite something. Keep your sugar level. So that ukiingia, you have energy. When the children are meeting you at the door, pick them, lift them. Eh? How many of the fathers here have removed children on the way? Wakiingia wakatoe koti. Nasha na tai, wakatoe tai. The thing is, you set the tone of the house. When you enter with that tone, it is the tone the family will have in the evening. And no wonder by the time your dinner is coming, no wonder by the time you're finishing dinner, you are trying to excite people about your presence. You're trying to tell them, I came. <laughs> Amen? So the man is to love, love his family. To love to love your wife is to love your family. When a man loves his family, when a man loves his wife, the family knows they are loved. By the way, I have permission to speak this as a family pastor. I have permission to speak this. Children do not understand that you do not love your wife who is their mother. Children do not understand how you cannot love their mother. They don't understand. They don't see things the way you see them. Children do not see her bad attitudes. And ladies, sometimes we have bad attitudes. Children do not see that. Children do not see what you say we have done. They don't. Children just know you are their mother. And by the way, if we call children here, we put all children here, all the children of the world here. And we put all the mothers here and all the fathers there. And we say, kill them to a kimbie. At a danger it okay pale. Kill them to a kimbie. They will run here. By the way, they can run there if the thing needs money. <laughs> it's a whole world of, it's another story. Yeah? When the children want to go shopping, they know who to go shopping with. Me, hey, the bargaining and the looking at the tags in a kuteta, they know not to go with the mother. 
So love your family. The Bible says this is the word of God to the fathers. He says, husbands, fathers, husbands, love your wife. Love your wives. Love her as Christ. Actually, the Bible, the, the, the Greek word there has no feelings. It says Hus husbands, love, agapao, love your wife, love your wife. You remember what I said about love? Uh, highest good, six your highest good. Love, this kind of love has no feeling. Are you not feeling? Because there are, there are other loves which are feeling. There's a love that really, eh, you can know your wife, thank you, Jesus. There is the other love, unasema, oh, she's my friend. This lady, she's my friend. But that one, he, he said, husband, love your wives. How are you going to love her? As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might cleanse her, wash her, that he might wash her, wash the church and present her, present her for himself. That is the kind of love. My friends, it might look hurt if you want emotion. If you want emotion, you cannot do this kind of love. Because maybe she has failed you. She has failed you a hundred times. It has, it is, I, I like this example because as Christ loved the church, how did Christ love the church? If I can tell you the things we do sometimes to Christ, hey, it's by the grace of God he still loves us. Sometimes we are failing, sometimes we are not praying, sometimes we are not giving, sometimes we are not obeying. He loves us. That is how the husband is to love his wife. And by extension, his family. How did Christ love the church? Washed her. Cleansed her, washed her. When is the last time you washed your wife? Now, some people might start getting excited. But what I mean is, what is the first time you made her look good? They are like, Pastor Leo. No. I, I don't. <laughs> when is the last time you did something for her? Christ washed the child that he might present her. I love those couples who like to wear vitenges. I don't know if I have that grace. But... <laughs> admire it. <laughs> I really admire it. I say, why? Why? Because when you're wearing the same kitenge, unam tokeleza, That's exactly it. That's it. That's it. As Christ loved the church, that is, in fact, it says love as their own bodies. Love. Love as your own. You know how we love our own bodies? We love our own bodies. The way they love their own body. The way you love your own body. Because your wife is one body with you. Every one of us, we love our bodies. We don't like people discussing our bodies. The same way. That is the, the covering we give her. Of course, there could be complaints here and there. People doing this and that. Family members saying, but you love her as you love her your own body, where you say you have a problem with her, you have a problem with me. Let me talk about submission in the interest of time. Submission. What is submission? The, the, the word for submission here is a word that challenges us as women, especially we, us women who are raised around, around some of these places like Kenya. Submission. Because sometimes we confuse and think that when we are being asked to submit to our husband, we are being asked to bow down, to become nothing. We are being asked to do what we cannot do. But when Paul is discussing this scripture, by the way, this particular, uh, this particular text, you, there are different scriptures that you can, you can look at. You can look at Colossians, Ephesians. I will be giving you the scripture uh, uh, references. But for now, allow me to say the wife is called to submission. What is submission? There are two words that are used here, submission and obey. If you look at the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, chapter 6, if you continue, you, you, chapter 4, 5, 6, you will notice that there are different words that are being used here. Ephesians 5, 21, 
there are different words that are being used here. When Paul uses the word obey, he does not use the word obey for wives. He uses the word obey for children. He uses the word of obey for servants, for slaves. He says, children, obey your parents. Slaves, obey your masters. But for the women, he says, submit to your husband. What is submitting to your husband? And this can help us. This is a key that can shift something. This is a key that if you, if you can... If you can catch this key and implement it, it can shift something in your favor. Submitting means, submitting means submit to his leadership. Submitting just means that you bend in preference to him. Bend in preference to him. Submitting just means just means that you acknowledge his leadership. You acknowledge that this husband of mine is the head of this family. Submitting just means that you accept that you are the ones. It's an attitude. Submitting is just an attitude. It's an attitude. It's an attitude of willingly putting him first and putting him ahead. Submitting is respect. Submitting is respect. Respect. Just respect him. What I found out is that sometimes respecting my husband means keeping quiet. Thinking through what I want to say before I say it. Submitting, respecting sometimes meaning holding back. Sometimes it means not going ahead without permission, without blessing. I want to buy this. I have money. Today, many of us ladies are buying things. We don't have blessing to buy them. And we are bringing them to his house. Today, many of us are doing projects which have no blessing. And that's why you find women are always in trouble. They are in trouble with charmers. They are in trouble with money. They are in trouble with this. And they cannot report themselves. Because he didn't know when you are doing that. So the key of respect. When you respect your husband, actually the Bible says that Submit as unto the Lord. Submit unto the, as unto the Lord. What it means submitting as unto the Lord? It means it is your worship. It is your worship. It is your obedience to the Lord. That means I could be doing this thing here. I could be doing the other thing there. But the Lord thinks I am disobedient. So when the Lord says, submit as, as unto the Lord, he means it is the area he is checking your life. That's the area he is checking your life. Many women ask, how can I submit to my husband? This man, when we got married, I am the one who does everything here. When you are getting married to him, you should have counted the cost. You should have, you should, and maybe people told you, how are you planning to do this? How you do? And you said, God will help us. So may God help you now. Yeah? You should have counted the cost. Maybe you said, you know, he, he doesn't like to study. You're the one who is, the thing is, you should have counted the cost. And the reason is because when God is looking at husbands, he does not see them the way we see them. God does not look at what they have, what they don't have. What God looks at is that you have a husband and that he has blessed you with one. That's it. He looks at that he has given you a head. He's given you a head. So my submission to my husband 
is seen as my obedience to the Lord. I don't know, because of time I will stop here, but I don't know how you are doing in your life. I don't know how you are doing in your life as far as love is concerned. When there is love in the home, the children will sense it. And love opens the hearts of the children. When the father sets the tone, the children are covered. There are many children today who are not covered because the fathers have not opened, have not used this key to open their hearts. As mothers, we have a responsibility. Part of respecting our husbands is pushing the children to them. It is pushing the children to them. Loving our children unconditionally, but pushing them to their fathers. It takes a father to call out the man in your son. It doesn't matter what woman you are, that is the one thing you are not graced to do. It doesn't matter what the father is, we push the children to the father. We love them unconditionally, but we push them to the father. So today I would like us to stand because of time. And I want us to just pray for our families. Like I said, this woman with the alabaster jar, she risked. She risked. She said, people might judge me. But then when you start to really love your family, they will not even, they will be shocked and they may not believe what you are doing. But as you keep doing it, as you keep being consistent, things will change in your favor. As you begin to respect the man in your life, yeah, respect him. Sometimes you are even right. Sometimes even you know everything, but you say, okay. You have, you have said, I don't do that. You just say, you don't, I will not do that. As you do those things, he will begin to trust you. He will begin to trust you. And as he begins to trust you, God will shift his heart. God will shift the heart of the family. Father, in the name of Jesus, just take time and pray for yourself. Pray for your relationship. Pray for your marriage. Ask the Lord to forgive you for when you didn't do things right. Ask the Lord to forgive you for when you took things for granted. You made mistakes. You made mistakes that have costed you. Ask the Lord to forgive you for when you thought you are equal. And you did not understand that in these things there, are no, there is no equality. In these things, there is no equality. There isn't. When you did not understand that the moment God has given you a head, he's given you a head. He has given you, as in, it can't be uncalled. He has already said you are harm. And maybe you're here and you're, you're a young lady and you are saying, how can I do this thing? How can I do this thing right? Today we've given you keys. We've given you keys that you can use in your life. And I want to ask you, if you're a young lady, to do your homework. Don't enter a complicated relationship. Don't enter. Don't go through the things others have gone through. The reason other people are going through these things, have gone through these things, is for your learning that you can see them and run away. And maybe you're here and you're given up on your marriage. This is an amazing month for the healing and restoration of marriages. This month, if you turn to the Lord and you come sincerely and you tell him, I don't know how to do with this marriage. I have done many mistakes. I have even left my home. I have ran away. I have done the other thing. Father, help me and guide me. We welcome you. You can come. You can talk to the pastors. They can pray with you. But I want you to do the right thing. Because this month there is grace. There is abundant grace. There is overflowing grace for the healing of relationships. Some of us might need to go and say, I'm sorry. It's okay to say, I'm sorry. It's okay to go and tell him, I'm sorry, I've been taking you for granted. If you just say it by your mouth, you don't need to justify it. You just need to say, I'm sorry. And then you begin to do the right thing. Father, we thank you for the grace that you've poured upon families. I pray, Lord, that none of the families in this church this month will run dry, will be without your spirit. None of our families, none of the marriages of this church 
in this month of empowered relationships, we'll struggle. Thank you for the grace that you've poured upon us. Give us a willingness to work on our relationships, to work on our marriages. Give us the willingness to give our relationships all that we have, Lord. To give our families all that we have. So that, Lord, Father, you may showcase our homes. You may showcase our families. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. Pastor Riggs.